Senator Hester? Yeah, so we're going to get started. Oh, we're on. Okay, colleagues, we are going to get started a few minutes early. That doesn't often happen in government or in the legislature, but that's the way this committee rolls. Uh, we're going to kick off with Senator Jackson, Senate Bill 138, Overdose Awareness Day. And Patrick Mahoney from the town of Chesapeake Beach. If Mr. Mahoney can come up and sit with the good senator, if he's here. Somewhere in the building. All right, somewhere in the building. Maybe he can hear me outside. Uh, let's see. And is Adrian Muldrow here? Uh, if either of those arrive, they can join the good senator. If not, Senator Jackson, welcome to the committee. Um, tell us about your bill. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Vice Chair and members of the committee, Senator Michael Jackson, on behalf of Den District 27, on behalf of Senate Bill 138, this is the third year that we're submitting this legislation. Uh, we have had some good fortune in this committee uh, over the years, and uh, I would like to thank uh, Senator Gallion for his uh, efforts in helping us with this piece of legislation. Uh, it's a very important piece of legis legislation. Uh, it's one that uh, touches us all, uh, Madam uh, Vice Chair. Um, Senate Bill 138 is a very straightforward bill that simply requires the governor to annually proclaim August 31st as Overdose Awareness Day. Uh, I've introduced this, as I mentioned, uh, this is the third year now. Uh, this is uh, Mayor Mahoney from Chesapeake Beach. Um, each year, Maryland loses thousands of residents to the growing epidemic of drug overdoses and drug-related death. According to the Maryland Department of Health, Maryland recorded 2,454 deaths between October 21 to October 22. We are waiting on the numbers for um, uh, 22 to 23, uh, with the preponderance of those deaths coming from fentanyl, cocaine, alcohol, opioid, and heroin overdoses. This data is clearly shows that total drug and alcohol overdose deaths are an epidemic that is simply not going to go away on its own. Total drug and alcohol intoxication deaths data indicates that Maryland lost 18,698 lives between 2007 and 2020. During that time, the 13,479 deaths uh, were lost um, between 2015 and 2020. That total number of 13,479 accounts for some 75% of the 14 year total account uh, for an in data, uh, for in data readily available by the Maryland Department of Health. The COVID-19 pandemic also played a significant part in the overdose deaths, as well with significant spikes in the years the pandemic was most active. In the first six months of 2021 alone, there were 1,358 unintentional intoxication deaths in Maryland. We saw 2,700 overdoses in the year 2020, and in the year 2021, slightly more at over 2,800 uh, deaths total. Uh, as uh, someone who spent the majority of his professional career in law enforcement, has been first, I've seen uh, these uh, matters firsthand, and the impact is tremendous. Reducing the stigma attached to seeking treatment for addiction uh, is one way that we believe will help save countless lives. I'm hopeful that declaring October, August 31st as Overdose Awareness Day would be a means to reduce such a stigma and to quell the suffering of those who are addicted and their loved ones. Many other states are undertaking similar leg legislative efforts to raise awareness. This year alone, 12 additional states uh, had this uh, like piece of legislation before them. This bill, is in particular, this bill in particular is modeled after a recently passed bill in the state of New Jersey. Uh, with that, Madam Chair, members of the committee, we'd ask for a favorable report in recognizing this, this challenge that we're having in our state. Uh, and we think that this uh, is a uh, one step to conquering uh, this challenge that we have. Uh, with me, I have the mayor of Chesapeake Beach um, who is here to testify and again, we're asking for a favorable report. Thank you very much. Mayor Mahoney, welcome to the committee. You Thank have, you. You have up to two minutes to present your testimony. I'll uh, take that. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon, honorable senators. 
I'm Chesapeake Beach Mayor Pat Mahoney, testi testifying on behalf of the, the residents and town council of Chesapeake Beach to express our support for Senate Bill 138. Small town mayors have boots on the ground. We see firsthand how drugs and overdoses can ravage a community. We know the victims and families. We pray, shop, and dine in the same churches, stores, and restaurants with them. And yet, the stigma still exists. My child wouldn't know where to buy drugs. It's those kids who live over there that, that get poor grades and come from broken homes. Well, that is wrong. That is not right. Uh, so step, Senate Bill 138 is a step in the right direction. It will reduce the stigma surrounding this addiction so people afflicted with this disease and their families seek and get the support that they need. This bill provides several important messages from our state leaders to our residents, and they are drug addiction is a disease, not a character flaw. Those who have died from this affliction and those who struggle with addiction and their families are valued by us. Overdose death is preventable. For these reasons, I ask you to uh, support Senate Bill 138, and I thank you very much for your time. Mr. Mayor, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your testimony. I'm going to call one more time uh, before we take questions. Is Adrian Muldrow from TAME available? Okay, I don't see Adrian Muldrow. So are there questions for Senator Jackson or for uh, Mayor Mahoney? I see none. I will just ask a question of the Senator, which is uh, the Moore Miller administration, Governor Moore has created a special secretary on opioid, opioid addiction. And I yes. wonder whether you have consulted with Secretary Keller about this bill or about programs in general to start addressing some of the crisis. Uh, Madam Vice Chair, great question. And uh, thank you. Uh, we have a pending meeting with uh, that particular appointee as well with others. And that uh, is a, a question or or a uh, topic that we will bring forth, uh, as we know, um, you know, we, we can use all the help we can get. So thank and, you. Um, I can probably help answer that question too. Uh, if you don't mind, Madam Chair, I, uh, um, uh, Secretary uh, Keller is former Mayor Keller and I know her well, and I have spoken to her very recently, as recently as the mayor's conference last week uh, about what we were doing here. So thank you. So August 31st, regardless of whether this bill moves, I suspect that if it's the date that is celebrated annually, that I suspect she'd come up with some great ideas and she, and uh, she is terrific. Former Mayor of Hagerstown. So, okay. Uh, right. I see no questions. So um, if you're good, Senator Jackson, that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 138. Thank you. Thank you both. Very, Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Okay, Senator. next up, we are, Senator Watson, you available? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Senate Bill 265, Senator Watson, 6888, Central Postal Directory Battalion Day. And if Mr. Moses is here, there we go. Mike Moses can join us. And if Secretary Woods arrives, he will join us, join you at the at the dais as well. So thank you. Welcome, Sec Senator Watson. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. I'm proud as a veteran in the U.S. Army, representing Prince George's County, where the vast majority of veterans in the state reside. Uh, I'm here to talk about and ask for a favorable report on SB 265. This bill will ensure that March the 9th will be a commemorative day to honor the service of Black women that Black women performed during World War II. 855 women who were members of the Women's Army Corps made history as being members of the 6888th Central Postal Directory Battalion. This is known as the 6888. This was the only all, only all female black unit to serve in Europe during World War II. During the height of the conflict of World War II, difficulties in the war led to a change in priorities and much of the male previously reaching soldiers on the front line had been halted. As warehouses began to overflow with unfulfilled deliveries, soldiers' hopes were dashed as they lost contact with families back home. To fix this problem, the 6888 Battalion, the Women Army Corps, all Black Battalion, including over 800 female soldiers, 
was sent to tackle the impossible challenge of sorting through years of backlog mail, even as some military higher ups wanted to see them fail. Through their determination, they delivered hope to soldiers and families across, across the world. The uh, 6, 688 Central Postal Directory Battalion consisted of five com uh, companies, uh, 855 personnel, including enlisted personnel and officers. After completing basic training in Georgia in February 1945, the battalion was transported to Britain and arriving in Birmingham at the temporary post office, it was the battalion's task to sort through the mail that was estimated to have a backlog of 17 million items, some of which had been in the post office for over two years. They worked through discrimination, prejudice, extreme weather conditions, and inadequate facilities. Their monumental task was estimated to take six months to complete, but thanks to the 6888's hard work, intelligence, perseverance, it took just three months. Not only had they completed the backlog from the US Army, but also backlogs from the UK and French as well. This accomplishment meant that they processed an average of 65,000 pieces of mail every shift. And once the task in Birmingham was completed, the battalion was sent across the English Channel to liberate France in rowing to deal with another backlog. In October 45, the rowing backlog was completed. When the war concluded, the battalion had been reduced to 300 and a further 200 would be discharged from service in January 46. Upon the battalion's return to the United States in February 46, it would be disbanded at Fort Dix, New Jersey. At a time, there was no public recognition of their military service, no ticker tape parades, no shows of affection. Many years later, in February 2009, the battalion would be honored at the Women in Military Service for America Memorial at Arlington National Cemetery. Three former unit members would be in attendance, Alice Dixon, Mary Raglan, Gladys Schuster, Carter. And in the same year, Raglan and Dixon would be honored by President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama. You know, our office tried to reach out to Tyler Perry Studios. And as you may know, Tyler Perry is an award-winning movie producer who hosted the Black Caucus at his residence during last year's National Black Caucus of State Legislators. Tyler Perry will be directing his first historical war drama for Netflix called 6888, which started filming January 9th and concludes April the 6th. Recognizing the contributions of the 6888 Central Postal Battalion and acknowledging the importance of diversity, supporting military personnel and families, and honoring the trailblazing achievements of women in the military Every March 9th, I respectfully request a favorable favorable report for Senate Bill 265. Thank you, Senator Watson, for the history lesson and for showcasing these uh, effective women leaders. No, I like uh, Black history. And during Black History Month, and actually just six days before the day that the, the elsewhere that they will be honored. So, Mike Moses, welcome to the committee. You have up to two minutes to share your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Vice. Uh, good afternoon, Chair, Vice Chair, and Honorable Committee members. My name is Mike Moses, a member and, and director of the Maryland Military Coalition, resident of Charles County, Waldorf, Maryland, and a Vietnam veteran, Navy. February 1945, a warehouse in Birmingham, England, were filled with millions of pieces of mail intended for members of the United States military, U.S. government personnel, and Red Cross workers serving in the European theater. Service members noticed that they weren't getting their mail from home. Army officials reported that the lack of reliability mail delivery was hurting the morale. One general predicted that it was a backlog in Birmingham would take six months to process. After several units were sent to serve in the European theater, African-American organizations, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, civil rights leaders, Mary, Dr. Mary Bethune, pressed the War Department to extend the opportunity of uh, 6 triple eight. Central Postal Directory Battalion, African-American women to serve overseas. The unit was multi-ethnic unit that was predominantly black with at least one Puerto Rican and one Mexican and was nicknamed the 6 triple A, consisting of 855 women under the command of Major Adams, Captain Mary F. Kearney and Bernice G. Henderson. After deployment to England, they worked eight hours straight, seven days a week. The job, which was supposed to take six months, was completed in only three months. For the women of the 6888 Central Postal Directory Battalion, 
World War II was truly a war of liberation. In conclusion, the Maryland, the state Maryland legislation has the opportunity to thank you for your service to the six AAA members and their families. Marylanders could observe annually one day a month to commemorate the successful mission supporting the millions of overseas veterans. I ask for a favorable response. Thank you, Mr. Moses. I just want to clarify, you said one day a month. I assume you meant one day a year, right? Yes, one day a year, Perfect. I'm sorry. Okay, just checking. <laughs> uh, so are there questions for Mr. Moses or Senator Watson? Senator Brooks? Uh, thanks, Madam Chair, Vice Chair. J just a comment, sir. I just want to say thanks for your service and, and welcome home, brother. Uh, thank you. It was worth it. You were uh, worth it. Thank you. Okay. And thanks for bringing the bill, uh, Senator. Okay. Thanks, Madam Chair. Books and thank you for your service as well as Mr. Moses and uh, and that of the good senator who brought this bill. Uh, secretary Woods, the new Secretary of Veterans Affairs. Senator Washington. Se I'm sorry, Senator Washington, please. Um, I just also wanted to to thank the the senator for bringing this bill. I knew nothing about this battalion, and so it was wonderful. And I'm just reading it that they were also mechanics and cooks and mm -hmm. did all kind all manner of things. So. Thank you. Thank you so much um, yes, for that. I, well, perhaps we can, if there's anyone that's left, um, you know, who are still here and alive, maybe they can visit us. Yeah. Uh, if there are some Marylanders, maybe yes, next year we can have them come and we can honor them. Their boot camp was six weeks longer than the average boot camp for a military individual. Wow. Well, women are stronger. That's what yes. my dad told me. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that. Huh? I'm just saying. That's, that's what my dad told me. So thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. I was just going to say, so if Secretary Woods arrives, we will uh, obviously welcome him if you wanted to add a couple of minutes of his thoughts. But if uh, if not, I see no other questions or comments. Uh, and so that completes the hearing on Senate Bill 265. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Thank, thank you, you, Senator Watson. And passing back to the chair. Thank you. Okay, we're going to welcome Senator Kramer back to the committee. He's become a regular uh, on an assortment of topic areas. Senator Kramer, uh, Senate Bill 842. And I'm going to call up, you've got two uh, panelists, uh, Abigail Snyder and Deborah Miller. So why don't you both come up here, signed up favorable um, as part of Senator Kramer's panel. And then uh, we do have two uh, Two unfavorables after that. Senator Kramer, uh, Senate Bill 842. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Committee, Ben Kramer back here. Thank you. This will be a much briefer hearing than the one we had yesterday. Um, colleagues, Senate Bill 842 would simply establish uh, January 27th each year as Maryland Holocaust Remembrance Day to coincide with International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which has uh, been in place since the uh, early 2000s. Um, out of respect for the committee's time and your intellect, I don't need to rehash what we discussed about a week ago about the importance and the need of reflecting on the Holocaust and that the lack of that recollection coincides directly with dramatic increases in anti-Semitism. Uh, so the bill again would provide that, um, that, that the, the January 27th be a day of reflection, recollection and determination for Maryland families, educators, religious communities, <clears throat> political bodies, bodies and media to remember the human tragedy that is the Holocaust and pledge to spread the lessons and the reality of the Holocaust to future generations in an effort to ensure that we never forget and bear witness to the mass slaughter of human beings as a consequence of prejudice, bigotry, ignorance, and hate. And with that, thank you. Hey. Snyder, you can go next. You've got two minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, and members of the committee. For the record, Abby Snyder, Director of Government Relations for the Baltimore Jewish Council, which represents the Associated Jewish Federation of Baltimore and its agencies, here today in support of SB 842, which will formally recognize January 27th as Maryland Holocaust Remembrance Day. I know the Senator didn't want to go down the rabbit hole that we did last week, so I'll just share a few statistics <laughs> on his behalf. 
um, in 2020, the first ever 50 state survey on Holocaust knowledge of American Gen Zers and millennials was completed by the claims conference. Maryland was ranked among nine other states with the lowest knowledge scores. Uh, along with the other states, we were put with Alaska, Georgia, Louisiana, Florida, Mississippi, and Arkansas. Those are not normally states that we like to be grouped together with when it comes to education. And additionally, 55% of those Marylanders couldn't name a concentration camp, and 64% of them didn't even know that 6 million Jews passed away, tragically, during the Holocaust. In light of these results, it's not shocking that, according to Maryland State Police's 2021 hate bias report, anti-Jewish hate crimes accounted for more than one in 10 of the hate crime incidents. And in the same year, the ADL reported a 17% increase in the number of anti-Semitic incidences. So we're here today trying to take that next step towards educating people, just as we did last week. By formally proclaiming January 27th as Maryland Holocaust Remembrance Day, we'll be taking a needed step towards educating our community on the atrocities of the Holocaust, honoring those 6 million Jews who lost their lives during that time, and taking the time to recognize and show support for the survivors that still reside in Maryland, and we do still have quite a few. For these reasons, we urge a favorable report on SB 842, and thanks, Senator Kramer, for sponsoring. Okay, Ms. Miller. Uh, yes. Since I just sprinted here, um, I'm going to take a few, just two minutes. So, um, and uh, good afternoon, Chairman, Vice Chair, and members of the committee. I am Deborah Miller, uh, the Director of Maryland Government and Community Relations for the JCRC of Greater Washington. As you know, perhaps you don't know, we are the umbrella organization representing over 100 uh, Jewish synagogues, schools, um, daycare centers, and agencies. Um, on a agencies that represent the community on a non-sectarian basis. Um, and for the record, I also am here uh, for Senate Bill 842. Um, I will not go through all the statistics, but I will tell you that um, this bill is critical to strengthen Holocaust education and, and address the disturbing rise of anti-Semitism, um, particularly because this bill is, uh, the purpose of it is twofold, not only to commemorate to commemorate the 6 million Jews and millions of others um, who were murdered, but to promote Holocaust education to hopefully prevent um, future genocides. Um, every year, the JCRC, we hold a, uh, in the greater Washington area, we hold a um, highly recognized Holocaust um, remembrance event. Um, and we also bring survivors to schools to talk to kids and teachers. Um, but these efforts are necessary, but they are not sufficient. Um, so despite our educational outreach, anti-Semitism, as you all know, is at an all-time high, leaving um, Jewish families feeling unsafe in their neighborhoods and students feeling targeted in their schools. So these efforts, again, are necessary, um, but not sufficient. So um, there is no uh, magic bullet, no panacea, we all know, to stamping out anti-Semitism or to improving Holocaust education, but this Remembrance Day can help build empathy and an understanding of our past so that we can move forward in a secure and more just uh, present and future. Um, for these reasons, we ask for a favorable report um, also on um, Senate Bill 842. Thank you all for listening. Okay. Any questions for Senator Kramer or the two sponsor panelists? Senator Brooks. Uh, thanks. Thanks, thanks Jared. Uh, Senator Kramer, th thanks for the bill. And what kind of impact do you think this bill would have on, on those attempt to negate and distort the, uh, you know, the, uh, the facts uh, of, of the genocide that, that, that was perpetrated on, on the Jewish community? Thank you for that question, Senator. I think it would be uh, another tool in the box to again ensure that we don't allow the lessons of the Holocaust to become some relic of the past, that we bring it back at a minimum on this particular occasion once a year with the intent of trying to encourage the media, and our schools to step back and reflect and think about what had occurred, why it occurred, the tragedy that it is, especially at a period of time when we have um, social media 
putting out so much false information. And, and if I may, committee, I was sent a link just this morning to an article that was on Yahoo Finance, not something I would look at, about the Holocaust education bill that was introduced in this committee last week. The comments that followed and colleagues, there were dozens and dozens and dozens. Every single one of them reflected the anti-Semitic tropes that we are looking to address. The comments were all about, this is now the Jews trying to teach our children about an event that never happened. It's the Jews trying to convince people that six million of them died, followed by somebody who commented, well, if they're all dead, how come there are some still around claiming to have survived? Colleagues, I was astonished as I sat there this morning reading this link when it, I read the article and then the comments. Dozens of them, not one single comment said, you know what, this is probably a good thing to be doing to ensure that the facts get out there, that we remember what happened. And I was shocked. That in and of itself is logic and reason for passing that bill, for passing this bill, because that is what we are combating now. That is what we are up against. The, the deniers were just, it was astonishing. So thank you for the question. But again, I really think this gives us another opportunity to have the issue brought to our attention and reflect. Thank you. Okay, any additional questions for the, any of the panelists? Okay, seeing none, thank you, Senator Kramer. Thank you to the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, okay. I have to. I have to. <laughs> you don't have to. I do kind of have to. Okay. Those of you who don't know the word fell, it's, uh, it's like, um, I don't know, bragging and it's, you know, celebrating something. So this is the first time that my former chief of staff, former legislative aide, Abby Snyder, is before us in this committee. And I think she did a wonderful job and I'm just so proud of her and she's so terrific. So I can't let that pass without saying hello and welcome. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yay. Okay. Okay. Um, with that, uh, we're going to move now to, we do have some unfavorables. Um, and so we've got Ayu uh, Kamathi. Kamathi, um, sir, why don't you come up? You've signed up unfavorable and you're going to have two minutes, sir. And then we have one virtual witness unfavorable as well. My name is Ayo Kamathi and I'm voting unfavorable on Bill 842. This is the United States of America, not Western Israel. I wanna remind everyone, we saved the Jews from the Holocaust. Never forget that. It is un-American to make us mourn a victory that this nation achieved that saved millions of people from multiple countries around the world. And when we use these two words together, the and Holocaust on this soil, there's only two groups of people that qualify for that. African people, my people, and Native Americans. Now we can get into a room and joust back and forth on who the Holocaust applies to on this soil but those are the only two options. As it relates to a Jewish Holocaust in this soil, the only one that I am aware of is the one that is being waged by Jews right now on the people in this Republic. I'm talking about the bioweapon injections. I'm talking about the sabotaging of the food supply. I'm talking about the destruction of the economy. And I'm talking about the staging of World War III between the United States of America and Russia. So to celebrate a Holocaust remembrance from the Jewish perspective and my perspective is to celebrate as if you're successfully achieving the destruction of this republic. And I want to remind you, it's not over. This is going to breed a sense in people 
of a recollection and a modern day general orders number 11. I urge everyone to vote against this bill. Thank you. Hey, any questions for the witness? Okay. So yeah, no, we can't let that no, slip. No. Are you gonna go? Just, it's, you can't. Words on this. Uh, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Can't let this go. Um, let's talk about American history just for a little bit. Perhaps you're not aware that um, during the presidential administration of Franklin Roosevelt, a boat with 800 German Jews came to this country and they were turned back and sent back to Germany. And most of those Jews died in the concentration camp. That is part of our history. The United States has had a long history of discrimination among a number of people. Jews are one of them. I am a descendant of people that were murdered in the Holocaust. My grandfather's family in 1942, they were rounded up, marched out of town, shot and buried in a common grave. That's part of my history. I am an American. And so this particular bill is not only about my history, but it reminds all Americans of the horrors of intolerance and what can come of it. And so, yes, I believe this is a part of our history. And I hope you can take my comments and think about it that way. Thank you. I would like to respond to that because, well, it was it was directed directly at me. Okay, I think she just was making a comment. I don't think it was a question. Okay, any additional questions for the witness? Okay, seeing none, thank you, sir. No First Amendment? No, well, you got two minutes. It's it definitely okay. First Amendment, right? Okay, we're going to go. We do have one additional witness signed up uh, unfavorable. Um, Vince McAvoy, virtually. It's Mr. McAvoy. Yes, okay. thank McAvoy, you. welcome. Thank you so much, Chair and Vice Chair. I appreciate it. Thank you, committee. Um, I want. I am against this bill. Um, I want to talk about the first time I, I, I ever ran into Senator Kramer was on his climate change bill, and um, I offered some ideas to, to help with energy issues in in Maryland. Uh, I have background in this, and I felt berated when I was done. I, he actually had a couple comments at the end of the bill. This is a couple of years ago. COVID had, had put us virtual. I was stymied because I'd offered good alternatives, and I. You know, I had a decade of, of working with the largest energy provider, and I know this is immodest, but I may, I just may know a little bit more about energy than the good senator. Um, and yet the sponsor proposed that since I wasn't for his bill, that I didn't like all of his ideas, that I was somehow askew. My opposition to this bill lies in the sponsor's mindset that if we don't accept every bit of this bill as an article of faith, that somehow that we have some animus. Now, I will tell you, I, I was very upset when, when they tried to take down the World War I cross. My grandmother lived around Bladesburg and I saw that cross about every week. I felt that a personal attack in my history, okay? But um, moreover, as I look through the bill, it's, it parses issues of yesterday and, and sort of particularly gets certain niche groups. And then there's no mention of Protestants, Catholics, I don't think in here. Um, and then it says that it has to have a, an extra, extra proclamation day. We have all kinds of proclamations day, Negro Beast ba Baseball Day. Uh, you just heard a bill for, for, for um, World War II women. Um, we have a lot of them. They just don't go to this extent. And so my issue with the bill lies with um, those issues of facts. It's out of context. 100 million people died. We had a worldwide. The population was what two billion we had a lot of loss there must have been a billion people displaced i i'm opposed to the religious aims of this bill it's it, and and also just in closing um tying this to crime and anti-semitism we have coarseness 
and okay. thank, bad thank parenting. You. Mr. Mac Ms. Okay. McAvoy, you, you got through your two minutes. Are there any questions for Mr. McAvoy? Okay, seeing none. Uh, yes, Senator Kramer. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Chairman. Once again, colleagues, I want to point out what you just heard is the reason we need this legislation and the legislation you heard last week. Senator. So with okay. that, thank you. Okay, so that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 842. We're going to next uh, turn to uh, next turn to Senate Bill 713. Uh, okay, hold on one second. 713, we've got uh, Gregory Morgan. Uh, that's you actually, Ms. Morgan, you're the only in person. We do have some uh, virtual testimony as well, but you're the only in person witness. So that is correct. Mr. Okay, Chair. so you're signed up favorable. You're uh, from the Maryland Department of Labor. And why don't you explain Senate Bill 713? Good afternoon, Chair Feldman, Vice Chair Kagan, members of this committee. For the record, I'm Greg Morgan. I serve the citizens of Maryland as the commissioner of the Division of Occupational Professional Licensing for the Maryland Department of Labor. I'm honored today for the first time to uh, represent as of official Secretary of Labor, uh, Portia Wu, who was uh, sworn in last night. So, uh, and she sends her card and guards. Before I present the testimony in favor of this bill, I do have five sunset bills today. So I wanna give a brief overview of our division, especially for folks who may be new to this uh, committee. Our division oversees the licensing and regulatory compliance of over 269,000 licensees in 25 occupational and professional licensing categories with the oversight provided by 21 appointed boards and commissions. That's 173 appointed members. The folks who presented earlier said in the state of Maryland, there's 70 boards and commissions. So we represent nearly a third of those. Each one of the 25 licensing units is a result of legislation passed by the Maryland General Assembly in response to constituent requests for licensing and regulatory oversight of these professions, trades, and industries. Annually, we process over 135,000 licenses, either new applicants or renewals. We have a team of licensing and regulatory compliance professionals, including 27 inspectors and investigators who process complaints. Currently, we have over 2,700 open complaints through the division of various stages of investigation and educate or adjudication. Our team is driven by a mission in providing the finest in customer service to the licensees we support and the citizens we protect. If you were a constituent in your district, needs assistance with a licensing issue or a concern with a licensee or an unlicensed service provider, please contact our division and you can always start with me. So let me move on to the, the, the first bill. I'm here today to ask this committee for a favorable report for Senate Bill 713, which is a sunset extension of the Maryland Board of Architects. The board licenses and regulates 7,704 individuals who provide architectural services pursuant to the provisions of business occupations and professional articles for this board. The board remains committed to accomplishing its objective of ensuring industry compliance with Maryland law, as well as local building codes and permit requirements for architectural services and generally promoting, uh, promoting a safe and sound residential and commercial construction industry. The board continuously works with industry organizations, members of the General Assembly to improve and simplify the path to licensure, while also maintaining the integrity of the licensing standards set forth by statute and corresponding regulations. For these reasons, the department respectfully requests a favorable report from the committee on Senate Bill 713. I do have some folks that are available virtually for questions and there might be some other testimony, I'm not sure. Okay, well, we do have um, Z, uh, Mr. Thomas from the, also from the Department of Labor. Um, is he just here for questions or? Uh, uh, yes, sir, Mr. Chair. Okay, well, before we go to the other virtual witness, there's one other virtual witness. Um, any questions for Mr. Morgan? And um, in the queue is Mr. Thomas, if you wanna bring him up quickly. If, he doesn't have any testimonies okay. available for me. Okay, we'll bring them up. In a, is, are there any questions for our Department of Labor folks? 
Okay. Okay. Well, Mr. Thomas, you're relieved. There are no questions for you or Mr. Morgan. Okay. So thank you. We are going to bring up next the other virtual witness sign of favorable Lawrence Frank. Mr. Frank. Okay. Okay, Mr. Frank, you've got two minutes and you're also signed up favorable. Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Feldman. Vice Chair Kagan and members of the Tripoli Committee. Uh, I'm Larry Frank, an architect with AIA Maryland, representing nearly 2,000 architect members across the state. I'm here to ask for your support for Senate Bill uh, 713 and to thank you for your support in moving this bill forward last year. The sunset for this bill is July 1st, and approval of this bill is critical in this session in order to keep the many Maryland architects working. I'd also like to take a moment to remind you of the important work we do. We are responsible for the health, safety, and welfare of the occupants of the buildings we design. We know that an average person spends 90% of their time indoors, and as architects, we strive to design safe, comfortable shelter, shelter. We work to make buildings more efficient. Buildings consume nearly 40% of the energy generated and distributed. We continue to work to better understand and make our buildings use less power and resources, be more efficient and healthier. We have members who have designed schools, homes, and other buildings that generate more energy than they operate. As a profession, we have many members who are working to design all buildings to be carbon neutral by 2030, having signed on to the 2030 challenge. Lastly, we are working to be a more representative of our state's diverse communities, Maryland is only one of 15 states in two jurisdictions that recognize an alternate path to becoming an architect. Maryland's board has recognized that a single path to licensure does not fit all needs. In addition to the path to licensure with an accredited college degree, Maryland allows persons with a combination of some formal education and 10 years of work experience to be able to sit for the six part architectural license exam. So once again, we ask for your support for this for Senate Bill 713 with a 10 year sunset. We appreciate your help in working to get this passed last year. We hope we can count on you again. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Frank? Okay, seeing none, uh, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill 713. We're gonna next move to se Senate Bill 714. Uh, and why don't we, again, maybe we'll lead off with our Labor Department folks, uh, Mr. Morgan. So just for the recorded record, I am Greg Morgan, Maryland Department of Labor. I'm here today to ask this committee for a favorable report for Senate Bill 714, which is the Sunset Extension of Maryland Board of Certified Interior Designers. This board licenses and regulates over 300 individuals who provide interior design services pursuant to the provisions of business occupations and professions article established for this board. The board remains committed to accomplishing its objectives of ensuring industry compliance with Maryland law, as well as ensuring the highest level of professional business practices through adhering to the continuing education requirements for licensure. It's pretty simple um, ask, but for these reasons, I ask uh, for a favorable report of Senate Bill 714. Okay, I know Mr. Thomas is available if there are any questions, but let's first see, are there any questions of our for the Department of Labor. Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Mr. Morgan. I'm gonna. We do have some witnesses. Um, we've got Barbara Picado in person up here. Come on up here, Holly Morgan and Heather Flannery. Those are the three additional witnesses. Uh, all signed up favorable. That's good. No surprises. <laughs> you get two minutes, but you know, since this sounds like a love fest, uh, you don't have to take the full two minutes. No, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. This is Barbara Brocado, and here in support of Senate Bill 714, and on behalf of the Maryland Coalition of Interior Design, I'll, I'll just thank this committee for its hard work and to say, as, as, as evidence from this afternoon, it's not always easy work. And I just commend you. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with the interior designers since uh, 2003 um, through two prior sunsets. 
and um, delighted to be here and ask you to continue their work. To say um, to my um, left is uh, Heather Flannery, who's going to have is the legislative chair, and Holly Morgan. Oh, that's the right and left. My dyslexia, right left. Okay, Holly Morgan, president, and um, I'll turn it over to Heather. I think she was going to go first. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair, and Senators. Uh, my name is Heather Flannery. I am here in support of Senate Bill 714. I am a certified interior designer in Maryland and the current director of legislation for Maryland Coalition for Interior Designers. I'm a healthcare principal at Horacopla Macht in Baltimore. And as a certified interior designer, it is my responsibility to educate our younger staff that interior design is not just about the aesthetics. We design spaces with health, safety, and welfare for the needs of our clients. And aside from understanding the specification of materials and where they need to go and the maintenance and, and abuse of them, we understand health building and public safety codes to design spaces that meet egress and universal accessibility requirements. And we understand building systems to provide proper lighting in various spaces such as higher task lighting and med rooms to alleviate dosing errors or lighting temperatures for accurate patient physical readings and circadian needs for overnight staff. And um, having those fundamentals allows us to create successful projects within healthcare and helps promote um, a faster uh, healing for the patients. And for all these reasons, I ask for a favorable report for State Bill 714. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you, Barbara. Why don't you hand it over to you? Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Madam Chair, Senators. I'm Holly Morgan. I'm a Maryland certified interior designer, and I am here in support of Senate Bill 714. I've practiced my entire career in Maryland, including interning in Silver Spring while I was in college at Syracuse. I have focused on healthcare and am currently healthcare program manager for Bialik Environments in Rockville and am chair of the Maryland Coalition for Interior Designers. The difference between a qualified and unqualified interior designer impacts everyone which is why the passage of Senate Bill 714 is imperative. A qualified interior designer understands the relevant life safety and accessibility codes and processes to design aesthetically pleasing spaces that support all occupants' safety, welfare, and access. We base selections on product research and industry standard testing data related to durability, flammability, weight limits, acoustics, infection control, lighting levels, and environmental standards, and that's just to name a few criteria we review. Through education and experience and examination, we have the tools which validate our ability to provide environments that support the health, safety, and welfare of Marylanders that occupy the built environment. For these reasons, I respectfully request a favorable report on Senate Bill 114. Thank you for your time. Okay, any questions for any of the panel? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, just yes. before, these guests were surprised. Uh, before I was uh, with state government, I was in the construction industry and working with the interior design industry, especially certified, is a very integral part of the of the build industry. And, you know, personally, I really support this, uh, this, um, this program, this uh, certified interior designer. So we appreciate it. Again, ask for a, a report in favor. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there are no Thank questions, you. so that concludes bill hearing on seven, uh, Senate Bill 714. We're in the next move to Senate Bill uh, 715. And Mr. Morgan, you're up again. So I'm here today uh, for the record, Greg Morgan, Maryland Department of Labor. I, I feel like that person, the man of many talents, uh, master of none. So I'm here today for ask for a uh, favorable report, Senate Bill 715, which is a sunset extension of the Maryland Bar Board of Foresters. The board licenses and regulates 186 individuals who provide forestry service pursuant to the provisions of business occupations and professional articles established for this board. In Maryland, licensed foresters are employed by utility companies to support the protection of Maryland's tree canopy while allowing the delivery of aerial, electrical, energy, telecommunications, and internet to our residents and businesses. Foresters are instrumental in working with developers in the harvesting of forests and identifying the best repurposed use of the timber being harvested. The United States Army Aberdeen Proving Ground uses the service as licensed foresters in the reforestation of areas of the APG that in the past was the dumping ground for hazardous waste. 
The board remains committed to this industry and serving a much needed service to the citizens of Maryland. For these reasons, we ask for a favorable report for Senate Bill 715, and I'm now open for any questions. Okay, any questions for Ms. Morgan? Okay, seeing none, that concludes bill hearing on 716. Mr. Morgan, back to you on Senate Bill 717. Uh, we're also gonna call up, uh, we've got Jack Neal. Ms. Neal, you're gonna come so up. So we here. on 716 or 717? Oh, I apologize. I, so seven, uh, yep, we're on um, 716. Okay. Mr. Neal, take it. Uh, sir, who are you? Because um, I do have uh, Jack Neal signed up, but I don't. Are we you signed up? Uh, Joe Ignatius, the president, and myself as a panel. Okay, have a seat. Uh, back to you, Mr. Morgan. As you can tell, as 716, just so we're clear. Sure. Yeah. Um, for the record, Greg Morgan, Commissioner of Maryland Department of Labor. We're here today to ask this committee for a favorable report for Sunset Bill 716, which is the Sunset Extension of Maryland Board of Examiners of Landscape Architects. The board qualifies and licenses individuals seeking licensure and issues permits to business entities through which landscape architecture is practiced. Landscape architects create outdoor spaces in which uh, Maryland residents live, work, and play. The board remains committed to the health, safety, and welfare of Marylanders in this industry. The, the, this includes ensuring compliance with local building, environmental codes, ADA compliance, and enhanced safety improvements, as well as stormwater management. For these reasons, the department respectfully requests a favorable report from the committee on Senate Bill 716. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, either one of you. Yes, Jack Neal on behalf of the Maryland chapter of the American Society of Landscape Architects uh, in support of this legislation. Uh, I do want to indicate that we have found the licensing board to be very responsive and the executive director to uh, those inquiries uh, that licensed architects have in the state of Maryland. And uh, we very much would appreciate a favorable report. Uh, I think it's very important to understand that many of the activities, design elements put forth by landscape architects is actually because of the many policies enacted by the General Assembly, whether it be blue infrastructure, green infrastructure, transportation related, and we have been uh, very busy in, in many of those areas. I asked Joe uh, Ignatius, the president, to uh, come with me today just to briefly comment on the need for this uh, extension. Okay, Mr. Ignatius. Thank you, Chair and Vice Chair and the committee. Uh, just wanted to thank you for having us today and and for this bill. Uh, and I'm, uh, for the record, I'm the president of the Maryland chapter of, the, of American Society of Landscape Architects. I am also a, a newly licensed landscape architect in the state of Maryland um, as of last year. And I I just want to thank you and and show you that we do quite a bit of for the outdoor built environment, de designing where everyone lives, works, learns, governs, and plays in the outdoor environment. And I just want to hopefully get this uh, bill uh, passed and we can continue to to do those things and for the next 10 years. So I thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. Any questions for any of the panelists? Seeing none, that concludes bill hearing on seven, Senate Bill 716. We're going to next go to 717. Uh, Mr. Morgan, you're the only witness uh, on Senate Bill 17, 717, another sunset extension. This is my last one. For the record, Greg yes. Morgan, Maryland Department of Labor. We're here today to ask this committee for a favorable report for Senate Bill 717, which is a sunset extension in the Maryland Board of Stationary Engineers. The board licenses and regulates individuals as stationary, as stationary engineers. A stationary engineer is a technically trained professional who operates troubleshoots and oversees industrial machinery and equipment, such as building boilers and heating ventilation and air conditioning and refrigeration equipment for large commercial buildings, such as this building. The board remains committed to ensuring compliance with this ever-changing industry and making sure that all licensees are trained in the newest technology available. For these reasons, the department respectfully requests a favorable report to this, from this committee for Senate Bill 717. And I'm available for any questions. Okay, any questions for Ms. Morgan? Seeing none, that concludes mm -hmm. bill hearing on Senate, Senate Bill 717. Thank you, sir, for your Thank you. five bills, I, I believe. Uh, next up, 
we're going to go to, I think it's his inaugural first uh, visit to this committee. Uh, my friend, Senator Steve Hershey, if you want to come up here, you've got, um, yes, you got, I think we'll let you get bring it. We'll allow a panel. Okay. I got, can I bring my panel with me? Yeah. Well, here's, we've, if you stand up at the new podium we brought in, then we'll be able to fill up your table because it'll be just, I don't know who's here or not, but Matt Boley, Matt Lentz, Bradley Humbert, <laughs> that Matt, out of the camera shot. Matt Liber or Liber, oh. and <laughs> Brian Tracy, Lindsey Thompson. Okay, so you got the whole, they're all, everybody here is signed right, up here. straight favorable. And those are all the witnesses, I think. So okay. Sarah Hershey, sample 497, you got the time you need. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I, I do say it is a pleasure to see you in your new role as chairman and, and very well deserved. So um, again, this is my first time here in, in Triple E, um, but I have a very important piece of legislation that we uh, we actually brought in last year, but as you, there's a change in chairmanship over here, and there's also a change in the chairmanship in the House Committee that will hear this. So uh, hopefully we can um, get some movement. I do have to say that our star witness from last year could not be with us because he's now the Secretary of Agriculture. So um, maybe that's uh, put a good word in from him as well. But uh, Mr. Chairman, um, for the record, Senator Steve Hershey to present Senate Bill 497, which designates Maryland rye whiskey as the state spirit. Maryland is finally rekindling its long history of rye production with 15 distilleries in the state using local rye grain to produce rye whiskey. Much like Kentucky is known for bourbon, Maryland is known as the producer of rye whiskey, <laughs> rye whiskey throughout the world. Major investments in rye farming and rye production have earned a rye whiskey trail and designation of rye as the spirit of Maryland would be a a, uh, would help us generate an economic impact to match the $8.9 billion brought in by Kentucky as the as known for its bourbon trail as well. So, Mr. Chairman, I've got a, a, a great peop, uh, group of um, experts that are very familiar with the growth of rye since we have made a number of changes here in the legislature over the years to allow distilleries, to allow tours, to allow uh, purchasing of products, but it's uh, it's something I think that we all feel that we can capitalize on, just as Kentucky has done with bourbon, and uh, certainly would be open for any questions and ask for your favorable report. Why don't we just go through the panel, and then we'll open it up. And Mr. Bully, why don't you lead off? We'll go down, and then we'll see if anybody has any questions. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee. Uh, Matthew Bully of RWL, on behalf of Maryland's distillers in strong support of this legislation, as you will hear from our excellent panel, designating a state spirit is a meaningful way of boosting tourism opportunities uh, for the state and distilleries, along with developing local agricultural opportunities and other related benefits. The rest of the panel will walk you through the many good reasons why this bill is important. I'm glad to ask, uh, glad to address any questions. We are the favorable report. Let's pass it down. Everybody's got two minutes, Max, okay? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Madam Vice Chair and the committee. My name is Max Lentz, founder and owner of Baltimore Spirits Company. Uh, when we started working on our business plan in 2013, there were zero rye distilleries in the state of Maryland. Uh, we opened in 2015, I think, with the fifth working still. Uh, and now that was just tip of the iceberg of a bunch of uh, us who have joined the party. Uh, but our core goal was to bring rye whiskey back to its heritage home place of Maryland. Uh, rye whiskey was really started in Maryland by the Irish and the Scottish settlers. Um, and was first produced en masse to support the Revolutionary War effort and support the militia. Uh, by the end of the Civil War, Maryland rye whiskey was the most important spirit in the state of America. You could travel all the way to San Francisco and ask any good bar out there for a Maryland rye whiskey, and they would have it. There was no Panama Canal. People were risking their life to go around the bottom of the horn to deliver rye whiskey out in California because it was that important to have whiskey from Maryland out there. Uh, it remained the most important spirit through the turn of the century, uh, and it is one of the only two uh, whiskey appellations named by name in federal code, uh, Kentucky bourbon being one and Maryland straight rye whiskey being the other. All of our bottles of whiskey on the front say very proudly Maryland straight rye whiskey. Uh, if we were not distilled in Maryland, that would be illegal. It is mandated in federal code that you cannot make Maryland straight rye whiskey outside of Maryland. Um, 
it's a really big deal. It's very important to us. Uh, culturally, it is the state spirit of Maryland. Uh, so, you know, we don't feel like we're, we're asking for any changes of opinion. Uh, and I'll save you all 30 seconds and turn it over. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, Madam Vice Chair, members of the committee. My name is Brian Tracy, President of Sagamore Spirit, as well as President of the Distillers Guild here in Maryland. Really would ask you to support this in making Maryland Rye Whiskey the official spirit of Maryland. I think it would bring do a tremendous amount for our state on so many different levels, especially an economic boom that we could see. When we first started about five, six years ago, we wanted to source as many local grains as possible. And at the time, we really couldn't even find any Maryland grown rye. And we started with one farmer and grew 50,000 pounds. And then next year, 150,000, so forth and so on. And last year, harvested over a million pounds of Maryland grown rye. But we harvest, uh, we mill about 6 million pounds of rye a year. So by getting behind this and really legitimizing it and showing the state support, I think we could get more farmers involved in this, which would be really great considering we're losing dairy farms on a fairly regular basis. So giving us that out and that option would be great. It would be, it's really great for sustainability. This last year was supply chain breakdown. Uh, the fact that we could drive 22 miles to get our grain versus having trucks come all the way in from Canada and the Midwest and so forth was great. And so it reduces our kind of environmental footprint as well. Um, so there's so many different ways that this can benefit us. And when I think about it, I, I travel the country all the time telling the story of Maryland rye whiskey. Our uh, mission statement is to inspire a global passion for Maryland rye whiskey. And when I travel, people are very familiar with it. And those that know history and know whiskey, they know Maryland was the birthplace. You go downstairs, you leave today, please walk by those display cases. You have a display case down there, Maryland rye whiskey, birth of an industry. The original American whiskey is Maryland rye whiskey, born right here in Maryland, long before Kentucky was. We've been distilling 158 years before Kentucky was even a state. I would strongly encourage your support for this. Let's own it. Okay, thank you, sir. Why don't you pass the mic? <laughs> well said. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Brad Humbert. I'm the owner of Bear Branch Malt, uh, which is an integral part of my family farm in Carroll County. Uh, to support our on-farm malting operation, we grow rye and other grains, uh, as well as purchase grain from other local farms. In addition to selling raw grain, we transform the grain uh, through the malting process, which involves steeping, germinating, kilning, and packaging. This packaged malt is then delivered to distilleries, breweries, and bakeries throughout the state. Uh, this bill would put a spotlight on the product that continues to positively impact local farms. Uh, rye is often used as a winter cover crop and has helped reverse erosion and capture excess nutrients that may otherwise end up in the bay. Rye used in spirits and malting fetches a premium price and further in, this would further incentivize farmers to grow and harvest this already useful crop. Uh, it also contributes a unique flavor to our local beverages. Uh, for the last three months, my malt house has dedicated its production to malting Maryland rye, uh, and I see potential for uh, Maryland rye to account for about half my annual production. <clears throat> Maryland craft beverage production uh, in the modern era is still in its infancy, and this bill would help promote Maryland producers uh, on a national scale. Thank you for your time today and your considering of putting Maryland rye on the map. Uh, with a favorable report of Senate Bill 497. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, let's go down to the end. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair, uh, Madam, Vice Chair Madam, Madam Vice Chair. Thank you for having me today. My name is Matt Liber. Uh, Mr. Chairman, you probably recognize me better as the Executive Director of the Maryland Soccer Plex in your beloved district. Um, <laughs> today, I have a different hat on. I'm representing the Board of Directors for the Maryland Tourism Coalition. Um, well, the rest of the panel got to talk about the history and the culture I get to talk about the numbers a little bit. Um, so we're, we're supportive of this bill for the tourism side of it. Um, as Senator Hershey indicated, the tourism side of the Bourbon Trail in Kentucky is very lucrative, and we think we can recreate that here in this state. Um, just some numbers to put out to you in 2000 or 2022, 2.13 million people went on the Kentucky Bourbon Trail. That's a lot of people coming into a state. Um, the good numbers out of that as well is 70% were from outside of the state of Kentucky. It was average spend per person is $400 to $1,200 per stay. It skewed younger, and they stayed longer than the average visitor to Kentucky. Um, if you look at Napa Valley with wine, that was 3.85 million visitors last year for going to wineries. 
that was $2.23 billion in direct spending in wineries. Um, it's not just the, the distillers that we're making this that are making money. We're also building hotels, restaurants, retail stores, and services around it. So, you know, bus drivers that are driving people to each of these distillers, there's a whole cottage injury uh, related to a trail like this. Uh, we already have things like this in the state. Uh, Montgomery County has a tastemaker trail that goes to where wineries and breweries and distilleries already. It's very successful. We can extend this to rye and have a separate rye whiskey trail. Um, I know the fiscal note for this said there's no impact on the state budget. I'm going to push back against that and say clearly there is an impact to the state budget. This is tax revenue that we're missing out uh, on this marketing. We're already set up to do it. And I think we can do this better than Kentucky can. And I ask for a favorable report on this. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Thompson, why don't you, why don't you uh, switch seats? Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Lindsay Thompson here on behalf of the Maryland Grain Producers Association in support of this bill, taking a slightly different bent to the tourism and the making of the product. I'd like to talk to you about the benefit of rye to Maryland farmers and to the bay. So fun fact, um, farmer delegate Natalie Ziegler is one of the larger growers of rye in Maryland. And we grow just over currently um, between two and 3,000 acres of rye for harvest on an annual basis. We think this is a great opportunity for farmers to diversify beyond just growing your normal corn, wheat, and soybeans and increase revenue on their far farms through that diversification. Rye also helps the Chesapeake Bay. So rye is grown as an overwinter crop, providing stabilization to the soil to protect it from erosion, and also has the potential to reduce total nitrogen loss by up to 45% compared to an acre planted after corn that did not receive a cover crop. So rye is actually one of our most efficient cover crops. So we're not only going to see a benefit to the bottom line of farmers and the diversification, we are going to see a benefit to the Chesapeake Bay by encouraging these farmers to grow more rye and creating this industry in uh, developing this industry. The industry is already created, but developing and incentivizing the growth of rye in Maryland. So I urge your favorable report. Thank you. Okay. Thank you uh, to the entire panel and to Senator Hershey. Um, we'll start with Vice Chair Kagan, then we'll go to Senator Washington next. Thank you. So I, uh, this committee toured um, years ago, and I have my bottle, I think it's my second bottle now that I got autographed and all that. So um, at, at uh, so that is, that is the bottle that I have at home. Um, but um, Ms. Thompson, in addition to everything else you said, isn't it also that the, that the uh, rye afterwards is like, fed to farm animals and composted and aren't there a couple of other things that you guys do either at Woodford or, or somewhere else if you guys want to speak to that I thought that I remembered that sure so there's multiple uses um, after the grain is processed for use in distilling we call that spent grains and that is able to be fed to livestock um, so all parts of the plant are being utilized Okay, we'll go around the horn. We'll go Senator Washington, Senator Brooks, Senator Watson. After those sunset extension bills, I can see how this committee um, you know, focuses. People sort of jumped up. Okay, Senator Washington. Thank you so much. And uh, yes, Baltimore. I, I, I think I was at the very start of the Baltimore distillery. Uh, there right. were my neighbors. I uh, saw them cooking out back. Now you're much more uh, legit. Um, but, <laughs> but I was there at the beginning. Um, um, uh, so, Senator Hershey, thank you so much for this. I've been very interested in, in particularly this um, rye issue uh, and what is Maryland rye. So I know this bill is slightly different, but now, uh, but I want to just raise this and, and ask this. Um, when I was first thinking about or talking about, um, you know, does, in order to call something Maryland rye, Right, so we have producers of Maryland rye outside of Maryland. Is that that's correct. I mean, right. yeah. So, so there's this Maryland rye, and then there's I think there's Maryland style rye, and so I, I think I want to go like so if 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 we're going to do this, and and I know it's hard to get sort of days and designations out of the the other chamber, but. Uh, is it possible or should we contemplate further defining what is Maryland 
truly Maryland rye. And to your point, I remember five or six years ago when, when I was first thinking about this, there wasn't enough rye production in Maryland to even begin to qualify or distinguish rye that is made with Maryland grown rye because there you had to do the Midwest rye and it tastes that 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 rye tastes a little different than than what Maryland rye tastes like so are are we near and so I'll ask all of you are we near anywhere where we be, can, can begin to further brand what is really truly a Maryland rye that has a majority of Maryland grown uh, products? Uh, if I might jump in, um, Maryland rye, uh, Maryland style rye um, can, can be a number of different things in the market right now. Uh, in the early 1900s, the, the only consistent thing about Maryland rye was that it was a known quality. So there are examples of rye that use a lot of corn. There are examples of rye that used only rye. I think that my personal opinion, and I don't want to speak for everybody, but I have privately spoken to a lot of people is that we don't want to be told what we can and can't do, uh, provided we're making rye whiskey and it's a high quality. We want it to be Maryland rye. No, I, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't but ban I, it. I no, would I, say I, I, marketing. So in other words, you know, when you think about the whole um be you know how we've evolved around the 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 designer beers that we now have all over and part of why uh, someone goes to a special place and pays eight dollars for a beer or two dollars is be like it was made and it has a different it was made there it was you know there's something about it so it wouldn't be that you wouldn't be allowed to but is there something in uh, saying that the corn, the mixture, the corn, the rye, that 60% of it was grown here? I just, just making some, uh, frankly, trying to create more of a market for our farmers. Uh, is there some benefit or, uh, to doing that? Yeah, I, I, um, it's a great question. Yeah. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. And it's one that, you know, we've had this conversation in the Guild many times. And I think one of the things we've run into, but that's starting to change is we didn't have the confidence that we could get the high quality grains grown locally consistently enough here in Maryland. It's starting to get better. As I mentioned before, we mill about 6 million pounds of rye a year, and we're only getting a million pounds right now. And so uh, I, I'm, I think we're open to those discussions. We might want to be careful how much we limit ourselves, but it could be something as simple as distilled, aged, and right here in Maryland, you know, because we do, we do have, we have people out in Kentucky and New England. And uh, I mean, there's someone in Kentucky selling a Pikesville Maryland. rye. Yeah. And so, you know, it'd just be like, it'd be nice to get Maryland back in the map too. And so, uh, and now there are actually, people get confused and start saying that's a Kentucky style rye. And it's like, you read the back label. But um, I think, you know, that is something that we wouldn't be opposed to discussing further once we had confidence in the infrastructure. Okay, Thank Senator you. Brooks, and then we'll go to Senator Watson. Uh, all right, th thanks, Chair. Senator Hershey, thanks for the bill. Mm -hmm. Now, this could go for any uh, of the panelists. Uh, now, when, when I think of, well, let me see if I can get it right. When, when I think of uh, Canadian, I think Canada. When I think of Scotch, I think Scotland. When I think of tequila, I think Mexico. <laughs> when I think of bourbon, I think of Kentucky. So you're trying to say that when I think of rye, I should think Maryland? Exactly. I think I got it. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Jer. That was a that was very that wasn't quick, even even a softball question. That was <laughs> okay. Well said. Said. okay, Senator Watson. Wow. All right. So let me do mine. Prosecco is not champagne and brandy is not con yet. <laughs> so, but you know, the interesting part to me. And, and I'm sure somehow with our Maryland distilleries, we can add some kind of super secret Maryland only ingredient that distinguishes from everybody else. But the tourism piece I find fascinating because um, we had a hundred members of my fraternity here on Monday night and we have a subset called the Crimson Society and we go to Kentucky four days. And it is literally, I mean, we, we spend a fortune out there but we're going from distillery to distillery mm -hmm. day after day cigar pairings with, with different whiskeys and scotches and bourbons and learning all about the craft. And we, we add a lot to, as you already said, to that industry. 
My question is, and the reason we're able to do it is because of the proximity that all these the, these distiller, distilleries are. We can go from bing, 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 bing and still stay at one hotel without traveling too far. How spread out are the distilleries that, you know, participate in this? And, um, you know, if we focused on that type of tourist piece, I mean, I, I just think it, it'd be a boon. I just never thought of doing that here in Maryland. And I didn't know it was a thing until, you know, I started having our first tours in Kentucky. But it is a big deal, really. But I, I don't think I can answer. They might be able to answer better about the distance between them. Yeah. But I, I ask you to go back and look at the actual bourbon trail in Kentucky. It covers the entire state. Mm -hmm. So if you actually tried to do the whole bourbon trail, it would take you several weeks to actually do it. Right, right. right. And, and so while we may not have a concentration in, you know, like a Louisville area, but we'll get there. I'm sure we will. And this will, bill will help. Um, but you, you said it yourself, you spent a good amount of money yeah. just traveling around and you probably only hit five or six of them out six. of, <laughs> out of probably 40 or 50 that are actually yeah. on the bourbon trail. Right. Um, so you just did a small piece of it and we can replicate that here very easily. Um, just we, we have the whiskey rebellion trail now and we have it broken up into pockets. So Frederick has a real nice density. So if you're looking for maybe uh, something a little bit more laid back, you also have middle of the Baltimore city. Um, there's a few of us right in the city too. So if you want kind of that city feel, you can do it without even leaving the city. Uh, there's a pocket of them on the Eastern shore. So there's these really great different pockets, all doing something fun and unique. Uh, so you can, you can actually go and just stay in Frederick and gosh, probably hit eight or more just in Frederick. Yeah. So it's great. Before the committee can sign off on this, we have to validate the, uh, <laughs> you know, we have to validate the goodness of the product so we can be, you know, loud and vocal advocates. So yep. I look forward to uh, talking to you later. Absolutely. We'll get the bill passed and then we can uh, have the, thank know, you very much. Have a session. All uh, right. Yeah. Thank okay, you, Senator. My Brace. only closing comment is it's hard for me to get past because my friend from the soccer plex, which was <laughs> set up, you know, for tourism, you know, mirroring that with the whiskey rack and had these <laughs> national soccer tournaments, international uh, state, you know, it's, Okay, I'll stop there. Um, okay, we've got Senator Augustine has a question. Thank you for the, thank you, Senator Hershey, for this. So I, I just, I'm just, at, in the, I really appreciated the history. That's really awesome. But I'm in the bill itself, we got Maryland rye or Maryland rye whiskey. Like, why do we have that versus just one? You know what I mean? Like, it seems to me like we would be creating potentially maybe some confusion or something if we weren't to just pick the one. So is there an explanation for that? So we actually were discussing that earlier today. I mean, it's, we kind of say long form versus short form, uh, same product, you know, certainly Brian or others can chime in on that, but it was just simple long form versus short form. And uh, maybe we could tighten it up to one or the other. I think we'd be okay with that. Yeah. I mean, if you tighten it up, I, I Maryland rye whiskey, but it's like Coke, Coca-Cola kind of thing um it's just a little bit shortened version but certainly I have no problem tightening up and embracing one okay thank you that's helpful okay thank any you. additional questions for the sponsor um okay senator brooks yeah but rye what's gonna has got to be what at least what at least 50 percent 51 percent rye grain and that's it okay all right thanks great job okay guys i think thank uh you. we've uh thank you scrutinized the bill enough We're, thank you um, that's going to be uh thank you all very much Madam Vice Chair, we'll try to get you that second signed bottle, maybe at the uh, bill signing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that concludes Senate Bill 497, and we're going to next move to the final bill of the day and the final bill of the week. Vice Chair Kagan on Senate Bill 860, Senator Kagan. And I've got Kevin Canale uh, from MACO as um, actually the only in-person only witness, and these will be our final witnesses for the week. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, colleagues, Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Gaithersburg and Rockville. And I just want to mention that this is my eighth and final election bill. Whee! There's a bit of a hallelujah yeah, thing for that. This is really simple. I'm going to be brief and I've got a couple of witnesses, but we didn't think it was worth taking the time of the committee to get a million people 
is about transparency, accountability, good government, and spending taxpayer monies wisely, um, as applies to the State Board of Elections. We've had situations where multiple millions of dollars are uh, brought to the Board of Public Works that the State Board of Elections hasn't even uh, considered, hasn't reviewed, hasn't voted on, hasn't approved. And it's not up to the governor, the comptroller, and the state treasurer to be experts in vendors and prospects for uh, for big uh, government contracts. So this just says that with the exception of less than 45 days before an election day and or, or emergency procurement, uh, with those two exceptions, that we really should make sure that any contract of $200,000 or more should be brought to um, whether a proposal or the contract itself should be uh, considered, debated, and approved by the State Board of Elections. They're there for a reason, and that's not just policy oversight and emergency regs, but how they spend money and which uh, voting machines, e-poll books, and other expenditures are, are chosen before they go to the Board of Elections. And I just want to remind you all that this body approved an emergency bill last year that the governor did allow to become law which said that 50% that the uh, the state and the counties have a 50-50 cost share. And so the counties need to have a voice in the table at the table. And that's why the Maryland Association of Counties uh, has endorsed this also and has common cause League of Women Voters. This is sort of common sense transparency. And I'll stop there and happy to take questions either now or after the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. I, um, we only have Kevin Canale signed up. Uh, who, um, okay. Uh, that's okay. Well, Kevin, why don't you start and then we'll go to the other. Uh, uh, good afternoon, Mr. Fine. Chairman, members of the committee. Kevin Canale here on behalf of the Maryland Association of Counties in support of Senate Bill 860. You have my written testimony. I will be brief as well. Senator Kagan laid out the bill. It is a very simple bill. It's about transparency, good government. Counties are obliged with running elections. And so oftentimes we see the state board approve contracts or procurements that oblige county funds without any local input. So I think this would provide an opportunity not just for local governments, but for our residents as well to understand what's happening, to weigh in, and just to be aware generally of procurement and large uh, contract decisions. So with that, Mr. Chairman, we'd urge a favorable report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, that's fine. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Vice Chair for having me. Nicole Hanson Mundell, for the record, Executive Director of Out for Justice. Uh, this this particular piece of legislation is very important uh, to Out for Justice for a number of reasons, but I'll talk specifically about um, how formerly incarcerated um, organizations and organizations that support formerly incarcerated people, um, especially during the election process, had applied um, through an RFP process to support the jail voting um, materials that go behind the walls. And I don't know if you all know, but we've been leading a lot of that work around jail-based voting, educating the population behind the walls. Um, and we found that um, some of the individuals who had applied through the RFP process and made it to the procurement process had not been able to fully get that access. I um, have the privilege here of having Mr. Paul Coates behind me, who is going to just be spectating. He's uh, the only Black-owned book printer in the country. Um, and I think this is a step in the right direction for, for equity reasons, right? And so we have a board that is overseeing and asking the right questions about proposals and invitations and bids on contracts. Maybe this is an opportunity for that board to see what more can be done around uh, equity and inclusion around our procurement process. Thank you. Um, and if you have any questions, I'm here. Okay. Any questions for Senator Kagan or witnesses? Senator Washington. Uh, uh, since Ms. Uh, Monday, uh, since you brought that up, um, I want to ask Senator Kagan: Is the state board uh, exempted, or are they required to abide by our procurement when it comes to MBE, WBE? I'm. Let me say that we have talked with our state procurement officer. We've asked about um, analogies and whether there are other agencies that work that they, the way that they do. And he thought that this bill was reasonable and was in line with everything that's already happened. In terms of NBE, WBE, I'm not sure. It's a great question. Right, right. But frankly, I mean, yes, and it's important. 
and this bill is about transparency and accountability, uh, it certainly wouldn't change the numbers or right. the goals, right. but it's a, it's a good question. Well, I'm not another, sure. It's another bill, but it is also about when we talk about procurement in the state, uh, making sure that Black American, Black Marylanders, women, uh, other uh, groups that are, have been excluded from contracts in the state. Um, and I don't know if Mr. Coates is going to, to speak, but uh, he, he is a printer, he's a union shop. Uh, family owned. Uh, and I get almost all of my, lit, uh, my materials printed with him. And so knowing that there's those type of people out there, but I'd be interested about, you know, the, all the different boards and all the different commissions and yeah. are, are they exempted? Cause sometimes I see that in some of our legislation, right? It'll say is exempted from this board is exempted from X, Y, and Z. This board is exempted. Let's so, talk about that. Let's yeah. look into that. Thank, thank you, Senator. But thank you for this bill very much, sir. Thank you. Any additional uh, questions for the witness, uh, the witnesses or the sponsor? Seeing none, that concludes the bill hearing on Senate Bill uh, 860 and concludes our work for the week. Have a great, great weekend, folks.